So I just bought this 1950 Chevrolet short bed out here in Little Water, New Mexico. It's a little north of Newcomb. And uh, we drove 400 miles from Tucson here today to pick this up. We are out in literally the middle of nowhere. I mean, the definition of it. I'll just do a quick walk around of this because we got to load it up and get back. It's still got its Chevrolet stamp tailgate. It's got the rear bumper on it. It has the chains for the tailgate. This used to be a US uh, Air Force truck, I believe. And Hank's dad bought this from the Air Force when they were auctioning stuff off in the 50s. And this has been a ranch truck all of its life. Um, but look at the uh, look at the bedsides and the fender. I mean, the fender's not rotted out. The bedsides aren't rotted out. The tailgate isn't rotted out. They always rot out right here. And uh, it looks pretty decent, other than some dings and dents from being used on the ranch. He said this is the seat. So I believe this is the seat that goes in it. Uh, they put a different seat in it for use on the ranch. It's like a it's like a bucket seat. It only takes up one side. We have two grills here in the back. We have the running boards over there. We have we got the hood hinges right here. We got the valance panel that goes in between the front bumper and the grill. It's like a flat piece. Uh, this is the piece that goes on the headliner. So there's two pieces to the headliner and this is how they meet in the middle. Um, look at the doors. Look at that. Not rotted out. The bottoms of the fenders aren't rotted out. Um, the hood's been, I think he said it got caught by wind, so it, it folded it some. Let's take a look inside. So like I said, he, they put a, uh, like a half seat in here, like a bucket seat, because they were using this for storage and stuff, hauling stuff around the ranch. But uh, look how complete it is in here. So it's a three on the tree. Some of them came with a four speed. This one came with a three speed. Still got its horn button, still got most of the steering wheel left. It's got its gauges, it's got its temp gauge, uh, fuel gauge, battery gauge, oil pressure. It has its speedometer, which says, uh, I believe 84,000 miles, which, you know, back in the day with how much people were driving these trucks, that's, that's probably accurate. Uh, you got your choke, just stuck, throttle, which has some play. Yeah. Oh yeah. Shifters freed up. Let's see about the clutch. That's free. Oh. Brakes are gonna need some work. Gas pedal. It's also stuck. And then here you have your starter. Um, you would turn the key on and then hit the starter on the floor. Seems to be a little stuck. But it's been out here uh, for the last 50, 60 years. It's got some rats turd, rat nest. It has a little bit of rust, but the floors, I mean, for the most part, are really clean. This is not rotted out. It's in good shape. Look at the bottoms of the doors. Those are in good shape. The cab corners are a little bit rotted, but... Uh, they all rot here. The cab corners of these trucks all rot here. Um, so we're missing the headlight buckets that go there and the front bumper, but we do have the front balance panel, the uh, front grill, and uh, so we'll be able to patch this up. The Chevy emblem still on the front here. Has the radiator in it. I'm not sure if this is a 216 or a 235. We're gonna have to actually see about that, but it's all intact. It's got its coil, plug wires, valve cover, oil bath, air cleaner, single barrel carb, even the horn. Those are always the first to go. People, some for some reason, tear those off immediately, but it's still there. Have our external oil filter still there, our voltage regulator, our generator, which I'm still uh, assuming is a six volt. I don't think anyone switched it to 12. Radiator hoses, heater hose has been looped around to feed back into itself. It does have a heater in it, I think it's an aftermarket one. These trucks did come with factory heaters, but I don't think this one had a factory one. I think someone added it. But this is, uh, this is a really, really neat truck. It's got all of its glass in it. I think the front windshield is cracked a little bit, but uh, 
that's no big deal. It's got its windshield wipers on it, cowl vent, side mirror. I uh, used to have one here, but that's okay. We can we can get those. Somebody painted painted flames on it a while ago. Um, somebody switched the rims around, which I'm glad actually that they did. Even though I'm an all original type of guy, the original rims these came with were split rims, and split rims are pretty pretty dangerous and and they're kind of annoying to deal with. So uh, these are typical, I think, tubeless kind of rims. So uh, very happy about that. Not 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 a bad upgrade whatsoever. But look though how clean this truck is. It's not rotted out. This thing is in really decent shape. You know, this is a very arid climate out here in New Mexico, so uh, it, it kind of saved some of the metal. The cab corners, I know they're rusted, but that's a given. I mean, these <laughs> they're always gonna be rotted out, every single time. I mean, it's just a bucket that holds water back there, essentially, so anyway, enough looking around. Let's get this thing loaded up and get out of here because we, we had a long way home. So we got the whole truck chained down, strapped down. The hood wasn't held on by anything. So we put it in the bed, put a few straps over it, secure everything, all our spare parts in the bed. But this building over here off to the left, Hank said that your great grandfather built it? Yes, sir. Yeah, his great grandfather was out here homesteading and built this in the 1800s, this old brick building. And there was an addition later on you can see how it doesn't look quite like the rest of the building but all of this was built in the 1800s and they've been you know ranching out here farming out here for I mean over a hundred years but I wanted to show you this before we left nobody uses this anymore but look at that old wood-fired stove that range is definitely from the 50s I, I definitely know that and those cabinets with the V handles and uh, that, I believe that was a sink and uh, like a countertop and cabinets there. That definitely looks 50s. So, and that uh, hood right there for the range, Hank said he watched his father build that by hand when he was a kid. I thought that was really neat. So, either way, guys, we got to get this rig started back up and get back to Tucson. I'm winded. <laughs> so... Let's get this thing cranking. And a quick word from the backer of today's video. And I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, AG1. It's important to stay healthy, especially when you're working hard on stuff out in the shop. I just went to the store recently. I saw that huge wall of vitamins and pills. Who knows how to make heads or tails out of any of that? AG1 makes it very simple. All you do is take some cold water, take one scoop of AG1, put it in your bottle, and shake it. It has 75 vitamins, minerals, and whole food source ingredients. This helps with your alertness, your digestion, and certain cravings. You know, sometimes I have a sweet tooth craving and that's not always a good thing. And AG1 has improved their formula 52 times since they started. And it has a pretty good natural flavor to boot. Make sure you click the link in the description below or go to drinkag1.com slash thetravisb to get one year free supply of AG vitamin D3K2 plus 
five free travel packs like this one with your first order. Again, thanks to AG1 for sponsoring this video. Let's get out and keep working on that 50 Chevy. So we got the truck back to the property. We got it unloaded. It's been sitting here actually for a few weeks because we've been working on some other stuff. And when we were there to pick up the truck, I looked in the bed to see, you know, how many of the parts we had, but I didn't take a, you know, complete inventory. We were kind of trying to get in and get out. We had a very long day ahead of us. Just where it was, was so far out in the middle of nowhere that uh, kind of in a rush a little bit. So before we dig into the engine and see what's going on there, I just want to take a little bit of an inventory, start taking stuff out of the bed. I want to see what we have, what we don't have. And uh, in the weeks that it's been here, I've been ordering parts online for it. You know, the normal stuff that I know I'm going to need. Uh, brake hoses, brake parts, wheel cylinders, rebuild kits, fuel pump rebuild kit, lights, stuff like that. So let's just take a look here. It looks like we have the running boards. Let's see, this one is, this one looks to be the... There we go. All right. This is a grill insert like that right there. Got the... This looks bent. It's actually... Let's just go ahead and bend that back. are actually pretty straight sometimes you get these trucks and the running boards are just looks like somebody beat them with a hammer mercilessly but this is actually in pretty straight shape and they're not rotted out oh yeah and then here is a grill that's in really rough shape I don't even think that's usable this might be, well, this is rotted out almost. It's pretty pitted up. You wouldn't uh, reuse it, I guess. Maybe you could. This goes here. This right here is a cab corner so that I guess he must have cut out from another original truck or something. You can see the drain hole here. It goes right here. You can see this one's rotted out kind of. There's a hole here and there's a you can see you know, it's stuff coming out the bottom. So this cab corner is rotted out, but we have another one. It almost looks like it was taken off this truck. It looks so close to the patina of this truck, it almost looks natural. But here's a non-rotted out cab corner for the passenger side. That's really cool to have. So here's a bucket seat, and it looks like... Yeah, see, there's the handle for the thing. and So this bucket seat actually matches the bucket seat that's in the truck. So he has two of them, there's a pair. Um, and he said this was the original bench seat right here, but I, it might fit. But to my knowledge, these trucks didn't come with folding bench seats. They came with seats that they slid back and forth but they did not fold up. Oh my goodness. This is heavy. Let's see here if I can get this out of here without. Yeah, this is not a factory seat. Uh, here is one of the side aprons. This goes, let's see, this is the one for the, so that go. 
Oh, I see. See how the bed is like, yeah, it's, it's down, but this is a cover. It goes there. The way they made these is they had wood slats in the bed, but uh, what's crazy is, is they had wood blocks that they bolted the bed to the frame with. I know this because my GMC over there is the same body style as this one, and I remember doing it. And those wood blocks, they rot out. They didn't use steel. Why wouldn't you use steel? Here is a, right when you open your hood, this is where your hood latch bolts to. We have a valance panel. This goes on the front bumper right here. So I can't remember if it goes behind or in front, but it goes there. It goes your bumper in front. Um, we got hood hinges. These bolt on the firewall. This is, this is for the headliner. These had a two-piece headliner. It would go here, and one piece would go here and see the screws along the top, and then this would hold it up in the middle. It had one, had one rib, and it would hold it up in the middle. So that can stay in there, I guess. This can stay in there. This does not look like it's for this truck. Here's the grill. Ow. Anyway, here's the grill. Um, this is the battery box cover. Oh, here's the other apron. All right, you know, we're batting a thousand here today. Sure. Cover right there. Battery box cover, and then this is a piece. I guess somebody cut out of another truck. It goes these holes right here. This are what the fender bolts to. There's bolts for the fender. And this looks like it's for the passenger side. Oh, I see why he did this. I don't know, maybe I don't. I thought, man, someone did a lot of cutting, but this is creased really bad. And this, this piece goes right here. The battery box is in these trucks right here. So coming in the cab, uh, it looks like we have, this is another hinge for the hood, the non-sprung one that goes right here. You can see that little zigzag piece. Oh, right there. This probably goes on the driver's side. Looks like three more hood hinges. Um, we have this. So we have another glove box door some u-bolts and these are the chains that go on the bed here they hook on the bed and bolt to the or they hook on the tailgate bolt to the bed so have some of those um, let's see. we have a jack don't know if this is the original jack but we have it and this looks like a battery hold down <clears throat> I don't know if this is the correct one. It looks kind of short. I don't know if this is the right one, but. And then we got this bucket. These are turn signal housings that go on the grill. Right here. So we got a couple of those. This one's got the bezel on it. This one, these ones don't have the bezel on them have to find them or get them or something. Here's a tail light housing. Here's the bottoms cut out for the license plate light. So this probably goes on the driver's side. Um, here are some bump stops that go under the leaf spring in the front. They bolt to the frame, I think. We have some hubcaps that say Zimmer. My dad actually looked these up, Zimmer hubcaps. These are hubcaps for a, uh, like a pull-behind trailer for a Zimmer company. I think they were in the 40s. So, looks like we got some extra wiper blade arms. Now, these look like 
the bolts that go in the bumper. These carriage bolts go in the bumper and bolt it to the to the frame there. These, I can't remember what these are. These look familiar in my mind's eye. I know I've seen these before, but I just can't remember what they do. These are some, oh, here's the other, this other hinge. Some fender mount lights. And some more hardware. Here's the cover for the other one. Um, I see. I know, I knew I remembered. These bolt here, this is the uh, glove box door hinge. Yeah, yeah, I know I remember things. It's just a thing full of oil. What's that say? Napa, Balka Lime, Balka whatever, gasoline. This is another heater. Um, it says Arvin. Noblet Industries, Columbus, Indiana, made in the United States of America. Not for this truck, but for something. Um, this is a headlight bucket, and he he also gave us these. These are the uh, headlight bezels that go right here. That's the headlight buckets and the headlight goes in that's the decorative piece so those are brand new let's take the hood off because it's not held on by anything and let's get to the important stuff which is seeing if this thing is locked up because if it is um, I'm gonna need to start taking the plugs out putting something in the cylinders This is a 216. I couldn't tell immediately what it was, but um, you can tell the quickest way to tell is there's a cover here that goes over the uh, push rods. And if the cover stops here, it's a 235. And if the cover goes up above and covers the spark plugs, which is kind of hard to tell, but this cover actually has an opening for the spark plugs. And that means it's a 216. I was kind of hoping it was a 235 because the 235s are a little better than the 216s because the 216s have Babbitt bearings, which you have to pour in and they're not inserts. 235s are easier to rebuild. I'm trying to see how I can get on this crank. It's funny, even in 1950, they still had a spot on the front of the crank where you could hand crank it if you wanted to. Uh -oh. Locked up. Oh. oh. Yeah, she's locked. Let's pull the valve covers, see what's going on, and we'll pull these plugs, fill it with some stuff, keep it moving. Our problem just got bigger. This is loose, so I can tell that somebody had this apart before, set it on, and just finger tightened the nuts. So I'm curious to know if this was off for a while and sat open because look at that nut. It's not on there all the way. This engine is guilty until proven innocent. There's the gasket. It doesn't look too bad, to be honest. I was thinking that I might see a lot of rust and stuff, but uh, I mean, it's just kind of dusty. It doesn't look, it doesn't look bad. Cool thing about old wires is they got what they call muscle memory. You don't gotta remember the firing order because generally it's gonna be in the same spot you just took it off. Well, it was running. It's black, like it was like it was burning. Now that one does not look right. That one came out of cylinder three. Let's remember that. See that? 
See how that doesn't look right? It's because it ain't. Let's go ahead and start dumping this thing full. doesn't look like it's showing any fresh oil on the dipstick or any oil. Yeah. Not an inch. We got that cooking, soaking. We'll give it some time to work its magic, see if we can get that motor freed up. But either way, I want to clean this out clean the inside of the cab out of all that rat turds, clean the bed out, pressure wash it, just clean it up a little bit, take that seat out. It's kind of bolted in in a weird way. It'll make it a lot easier to work in here. So I let the motor sit for about a day with Marvel Mystery Oil in it and then I took the plugs out this morning and filled the cylinders full of acetone and then I waited most of the day and I tried to pry it over and not only did it not break loose but I broke one of the knobs on the uh, crank there and so yeah I didn't mean to do that, that was an accident but now I have a big pair of channel locks on it I'm trying to get it. And I'm gonna try this one last thing here with these channel locks, trying to break it apart. And if it won't come apart uh, tonight, I'm just gonna bust the head off. <clears throat> oh my gosh. <clears throat> yeah. I think we're going to have to take some different measures. All right, it's in here now. That took way longer than I thought. It's like dark now, but that gives me a good chance to show you guys something new I just did to the shop. Look at that. <laughs> Isn't that nice? I put lights in the shop. That'll be in a separate video, putting lights in and doing a few other things. Um, but yeah, oh my gosh, this is such an upgrade from uh, literally not being able to work at night pretty much. So yeah, you can see everything, hardly even cast a friggin' shadow. It is just well lit in here. You could totally work into the night with these bad boys. I got four of them here and four of them on the other side controlled from two different light switches. One here, one over there, so you can do half at a time. So yeah, it's getting pretty late tonight. Uh, we will continue the fight with this engine in the morning. So it's the next day and I wanna try two more things before I bust the head off, because I. I'm getting the eking feeling that's where I'm headed. I want to try and get on the crank one more time with the channel locks and then I'm going to jack it up, uh, drain the oil out, just see what's in there, just see, you know, is there a lot of water or what. Then I want to get a pry bar on the crank. I'm sorry, not a pry bar on the crank, a pry bar on the uh, flywheel. We'll try that and if it still won't budge, then we're going to have to change our tune here. Okay, so, oops, wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> 
Nope. <clears throat> Not a lick. Probably what's going to come out is a lot of marvel and acetone. You know, maybe that jug I pulled out of the cab earlier. Uh, that might have been the oil that was in this truck. I don't know. Water. I think. <laughs> Not a lot of acetone. <laughs> a lot of acetone. That's why it's so thin. Oh, woo -wee. Stuff smells strong. Yeah, I think it's a lot of acetone and marble. Yeah. I mean, judging by what's in the bottom of this pan, it's, I don't think there was anything in it. I think the oil in that jug I pulled out was the oil in here and it was empty. That's why there was nothing on the dipstick and everything that just came out is everything I've been putting in the cylinders. So here's the flywheel cover. You can see the seam right there. And here's the screws, there's one on either side, but the problem is, is it's a very, very bad angle to get to and there's no hole underneath. So it's just a, it's just a rough angle, but they actually came loose. But the cool thing is, is these are actually slotted. So the metal doesn't go above this. So I loosen these, took the fronts out. We should be able to slide this forward. There's some rat's nest in there. That looks like uh, seat material. That doesn't look like it's from the desert. That looks like it was from the upholstery. Actually, I know exactly, that's exactly what it is. Let me push the clutch in, hold it with a brick, and then uh, let me get on this with a pry bar. See it like moving a little bit. Oh! <sighs> Thought something happened. <sighs> see it? Did you see it? I saw it. I know I saw it. You can't lie to me now. You gave yourself up. <sighs> See it? It's moving. She's moving rough though. <whistles> rough as a cob. Mm. I got it. I think I got it. Boy, she's turning really rough. We might have to sit here and kind of work it, you know, but it ain't locked up now. You know, it's probably working its way up or down that rusty cylinder or whatever. It's just catching it as it's going up and it's just rough. This gasket is done anyway, so. 
I'm gonna just wipe out some of this crud back here. I mean, it's I don't want that circulating throughout the engine. It's just silty dirt. Look at that. Wipe some of this out, and then I'm gonna tap on the uh, valves because I don't want to crank this and bend a push rod or something. So I kind of want to make sure that they'll move. That one's moving. That one's moving. 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 I think she's moving. Moving. Okay. I think they're moving. I'm going to put a little bit of oil in it. Um, I found a drain hole right here. So there's a feed line right here that feeds these rockers. And then I guess there's a drain that goes back down into the crankcase. I'm going to utilize that. Just put some oil down in there. This oil is used, it's out of my Cummins. But just until we know the condition of this motor, you know, this will still do a fine job of lubricating everything. And once we see it run or whatever, then we'll put some clean oil in it. So it's not a big deal. All right, let's check the oil. I put a lot in there. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely on the mark now. And also, what was going on was is there's some oil on the ground there, and I thought, well, I must be spilling it from up here or something. This cover here, see right there by the distributor? So I think the oil's coming out that cover, because it's directly below where I'm putting it, so we already have a leak there. And another thing I want to address before I start trying to crank it and stuff is, so this oil filter has a feed line right here that turns into rubber right about here and goes to the block and this is actually pliable so I'm not worried about this but the return line is broke and it goes right here so what I want to do is I want to cap this off somehow because the oil will still circulate in the engine even without the filter curious to know just what it looks like in here has a rubber gasket on it. These old filters had handles on them. I kind of like that. Look at that. There's some crud on top of it, but yeah. See the oil level? It's a pretty stout filter. That's big. Yeah, there's still some oil in there, but the fact that there's oil in it at the bottom and it hasn't leaked out even though this is broken means that that line's plugged anyway right there. All right, we'll just put this back in. I just wanted to see what it looked like and what was in there. So what we're gonna do about that, I found this little plug. I knew I had one and I found it. Um, there's some line wrenches out, it's like, Right here. Probably a nine. Yeah. Mm. All right, she broke loose. Here's the open fitting. Take our other quarter inch, right? Oh, 
Lucky me. Didn't even have to go to the store. That should be good enough for now. Well, amazingly, the battery box is still in it. Has a little bit of rot in the battery box, but it's still there. So, since my GMC is the same battery, we'll just plop this one in here. No modifications required. Fits like a glove. I already unhooked everything else. Like, um, there's a big wire that comes off the starter that feeds all the accessories, which are all still 6 volt. So, um, I took that wire off, so we're, we should be good. We shouldn't get any sparks or anything like that. Yeah. Is that starter locked up? I mean, is the button pressing it? It's not even trying. Yeah. This might be dirty up in here. Remember on that Dodge we did? Let's see what's up in there. Can you hand me my, my headlamp? Right there. Oh, actually, I got a better idea. <laughs> I've been looking for a reason to use this old mechanics light that I found at an antique store. This is the real deal. Look, it even puts out light like it's 1950. See that? Look at that thing smoking. That's what I'm talking about. Look at that thing doing what it's supposed to be. That's grease from the 50s, man. <laughs> <laughs> the old dude that had it, turned it off, and retired. That was the end of it. Yeah. Look, look, look. I even get me an old wood-handled screwdriver. It's too late, man. Look at that. It's full of dirt. Yeah. The whole starter's full of dirt, probably. Look at that. How? You got that battery unhooked? Yeah, it's unhooked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's unhooked. What the heck? Look at that. Whole thing's full of dirt. That contact must. Must. Man, what? What the heck is going on in here? I heard something. I put a vice grip on the... Oh, I heard something. brush it might be bad. Um, leave that thing hooked up and go get this screwdriver and push push them brushes. Push them. Well I don't even think it's dirty. I think it's just not making good connection in the brush. Flicking this brush. Let it sit and run for a minute. Hear it?
really wanting to go now. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's really speeding up. Yeah. Jeez. Just, Woo! Sometimes you gotta, sometimes they have to learn that they're starters again. They've been setting for 40 years and. and This piece is connected to the lever inside the foot pedal, and as you press in, the Bendix comes out. Your and foot's then, the solenoid. Yeah, your foot's the solenoid. Uh-oh. We probably... There we go. Ready? What was that? Blew something out of that cylinder. All right, you ready? Yeah. We hit that hard spot. We got to back it up so we can get a good run at it. Yeah. So what's going on is we're hitting this hard spot. That's why it quit. And number three cylinder spurted all that stuff out. So we're backing it up by hand. And then we're going to make a run at it again with the starter to try and just get past that hard spot and once it ever does a full rotation it'll keep going we just it's just got to get past that one rough spot we don't know the verified story on this truck only what the guy told us when we bought it um, but just from what we're seeing not only do I think it hasn't ran in 40 or 50 years at least uh, I think it was sitting with the hood off and possibly the valve cover off for that time and what leads me to believe that or us is what dad pointed out is if you look at this hose here the sun bakes these hoses and you can see this is sun bake right here and you can see that it's red underneath because it's shaded you can see it got it here too and when the sun's directly overhead you can see how it'll beat this and beat this but the angle of the sun you know it didn't get this so this the color stayed and if you look at all the wires every single wire has the color baked off of it you know, these were cloth wrapped, but they still were, you know, color coded. And uh, every single one of these is white, which leads me to believe that uh, the sun was on them for a very, very long time. And also another telltale sign is the sun bakes paint off where the sun hits it. And you can see this firewall is completely baked of its paint. So are the inner fenders. When the sun is directly overhead, that's where it's going to hit the inner fenders, the firewall. And back here where it's shaded, that indention back there where it's shaded still has its color. And you can see directly when the firewall starts to go underneath the truck, you can still see paint. So this thing sat open for many decades, not years, decades. All right. You start? Yeah. <laughs> you ready? Go. I think it passed it. Did we break a... Uh... So I'm out here again, and it's the next day. Before I retired last night, I put some... What is oil doing on this flywheel? Are we leaking from somewhere else now? Jeez. Before I retired last night, I put Marvelius in the cylinders. And what you heard last night with the starter just whirring and it, the engine wasn't turning is I'm pretty sure I messed up the Bendix or the Sprag clutch inside that starter. Uh, that's why you would hear it spinning, but it wasn't doing anything because a Sprag clutch isn't like a clutch 
that's in here, you know, like clutch material. A sprag clutch inside of a starter is actually like a one-way bearing. It almost looks like a bearing. And the only reason that I kind of know what it looks like in there is because I saw one once in an automatic transmission. And it will turn freely one way, but when you try and turn it backwards, it locks up. That's exactly how a starter works, is that when you engage it with the flywheel, the sprag locks up because it's under load and it turns the motor. And there's a split second when the engine is beginning to start and it's outpacing the starter. Well, if the gear was just locked onto the starter and it couldn't spin freely the other way, the engine would start to run your starter and you'd tear your starter up that sprag clutch releases to allow the engine to turn faster than the starter because now the starter is not under a load the engines actually trying to turn the starter and it'll free up now what I'm scared of is that I busted that sprag clutch to where it'll spin freely in either direction and it won't turn the motor because I messed up its backwards locking ability now see how good it's turning now look at that like butter remember yesterday when i was having to uh, grunt, grunt, grunt. yeah you know i get comments about that all the time you grunt too much it gives me horsepower it's just something it's a byproduct you know and i should have worked this motor more over that hard spot before i tried using a starter to be honest um that's kind of my fault, but it's turning really good now. Okay, so I got the battery hooked up. Let's try this starter and see if something's changed from yesterday. And if it does engage, I got a compression gauge hooked up to cylinder number one. Uh, usually if my dad was here, I would put my fingers over the cylinders. And it's a very crude method of testing compression, but at least you can tell if you have it but I can't do both at the same time, so I got an actual gauge hooked up. Let's get one. It's just a shot. There we go. Let it turn, let it turn. Get over that dead spot. <laughs> yes! I thought I heard some resistance. That might mean we have compression. Yeah, we got about 70 PSI. I mean, it's not great, but it'll run on that. I didn't feel a ton of resistance on that one, so I'm not expecting much. Yeah, sub 30. Whoa, that's terrible. I should probably write this down so I remember which cylinders have what compression. This ain't looking good. Nothing. Not even twenty. Dang it. Oh my gosh. Zero. Oh my lord. This isn't looking good at all. <sighs> all right, guys. I hope you had a Merry Christmas in my world. It is the day after Christmas, and we're still trying to save this motor. Uh, the compression was not good and uh, at all. Uh, I think one in five were the only ones that had compression that would even possibly work. So what I did last night, just hail marry it. I'm still trying to save this motor without having to take the head off or take it apart. 
I pour diesel and transmission fluid down the um, cylinders and I also poured a bunch of diesel down the intake here just to maybe get on the valves some to try and maybe uh, there's crud on the valves not giving it compression and maybe the diesel and tranny fluid will help loosen up those rings and another thing my dad told me to check the valve lash so if the valves are too tight holding the valve open in any way shape or form it won't have compression you should have a little bit of lash a little bit of play and this valve is up but there's no play there's no play this one I think is down some hear that hear how you can hear that wiggling that's actually a good thing um, because when the motor heats up everything expands and then the valve lash tightens up a little bit but when it's cold here you go see that one you have some play there what I might do before I try and crank this over again is uh, crank it over a little bit on all the cylinders to where the valves are, are up and maybe get to the correct valve lash and I also want to replace the Bendix on that starter because half the times I crank it it just whirs and whirs and whirs and then sometimes it'll catch and crank the motor I think I tore the Bendix up and the Sprag clutch so I got another one so here is the Sprag for a starter and this is what obviously engages the flywheel and this bearing looking affair right here, the silver piece is your sprag clutch, sprag bearing, whatever they want to call it, but is that it'll rotate freely one way forever. It'll just go, but backwards it won't. So when it's engaging the motor, it will not release, turns it. And when the motor is beginning to run, it will let this spin freely because the flywheel is spinning faster than this. And if it was connected directly, it would actually drive this tear the motor up so i think this is what i destroyed I'm, I'm almost positive i'm gonna just turn it over a little bit yeah it's squirting out some fluid you gotta get it out you gotta get it out of your system Cylinder one exhaust valve has lash, but the intake doesn't. So I'm gonna just start cracking these loose and just back them off just a hair until I can feel lash. There we go. All right, cylinder two, no lash, and I think this one's depressed. You can rotate this. You can rotate this push rod, but not this one. So this one is under pressure. So let's get let's get them loose. Crank it over just enough to where the cam's not on them. We have some lash. Nothing. Loosen these up just a hair. Hear the clickety clack now? There. That should be just enough. Okay. Uh, cylinder number three. Let's give it some crank. Hear it now? Not engaging? There it goes. Got lash there, none here. I can't turn the push rod. Maybe I didn't go far enough. Yeah. 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 Okay. 
Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. A little bit. So, okay. Well, I don't know what else to do other than to let, check compression again. Sixty. Ooh, ninety. No way. Oh my gosh, no freaking way. <gasps> Thirty. I think it's better than what it was. Nice. Yes, yes, yes. Eighty. This one four had ten. Oh, dude. Yes. Oh my gosh. All right, look, 60, that's still not the best, but look, it will run on 60. Anything like 50 and above, it will run. 60 is good. Look at that. What is that, 100? Ooh, ooh, baby, that was almost in the green. I'm gonna try number six again, cause I just don't believe it. Come on. Oh my gosh, 120. <laughs> what the heck? So here's our tallies from the first and second tries of compression testing. 70, 20, 20, 10, 50, 15. Second go around. From 70 to 60, 20 to 90, 20 to 30, 10 to 50, 50 to 60, and 15 to 120. And 100% will be firing the strongest on six. So this engine, guaranteed fact at this point, will run. Uh, that compression is not obviously rebuilt motor status good, but it is enough to run on. Guarantee it. Okay, so now that we have the compression situation sort of weeded out, uh, we need spark and fuel. And I have not touched or looked at this ignition system at all. Um, with the condition that everything else has given us, with the fight that it's given us, um, I think we're probably going to put a new set of points in, and I'm going to convert this to 12 volts. So I am going to put a 12-volt coil on it. Um, Let's just take this off. There we go. Just lightly take that off. So I have this coil right here, which is an old uh, Delco Remy one. This is probably from the 50s too, but this is a 12 volt coil. We'll take this one off, put this one on, and let's see what's going on with these points here. Doesn't look too bad in here, but I might just do it at a good, out of good measure, you know. When you hear that crack, when you take these screws loose, that's how you know dang well they haven't been off in many years. All right, I'm sure we're gonna need to adjust those points gap, but there it is. And on goes another 60-year-old Delco Remy coil. I'm sure this one's not internally resisted. I'm going to have to get a ballast resistor for it, but it'll work long enough to start it. Look at that. Looks just like the rest of the truck, even. And I gapped the points kind of crudely. Um, I didn't do it with an actual feeler gauge. Um, I might have to. I don't know yet. 
clean these spark plugs up and uh, sand off the ends a little bit. Put them back in. And I don't know if it was adjusting the valves or if it was the diesel and tranny fluid combination last night that really got us the compression. I think one of the one or two of the cylinders was a little tight, but I don't know, maybe that diesel and tranny fluid did the trick. Last one, this is cylinder number three. This is our problem child cylinder. Cap is back on now, all the spark plugs are clean. We're getting power here. I'm drawing it to the coil, I'm getting power to the coil. And here's our negative wire. This is the factory one that was savable, so I just put it back on. But we're not getting power because uh, I was just adjusting the points and they're open. And I also have a spark plug hooked up right here. Um, we're gonna test for spark, but I wanna see, let me just crank it over just a blip and see if the points close. We really gotta fix that Bendix. Okay, just not getting a good. I'm getting it to the other side of the coil. Maybe this is dirty because I'm getting it, but not here. All right, let's test for spark. I got it hooked up. I was hearing something. I heard a bunch of pops. All right, well now that we've verified that we do have spark, all that's looking good, we gotta finish with our fuel. And these single barrel carbs are pretty tough, pretty durable. The choke, this was all froze, so the choke is working. And this, I am not 100% sure what it is doing, but down here you have your throttle and it's, uh, I think it's locked up. It's not doing much of anything. It's really loose and uh, I don't know. I need to get it unstuck or figure out what's going on there. So I might take this carburetor off, try and get that unstuck and take the top off, see what's down inside because this is what I found in the air cleaner. Dirt. Look at that. I mean, one would hope that all the dirt got in here and not in the carburetor, but um, yeah, that's really bad. So I think it's a good measure to take the top off of that thing and see what's going on. Ho <laughs> ho! I never get lucky twice like that. I think everything's unhooked. Throttle. Oh, that's temperature. I don't want to be messing with that. Uh, choke unhooked, throttle unhooked, vacuum advance goes down here, so I should unhook that. All right, so here's, so here's the carburetor, and this is free, that's free, and you can see the throttle plate in there is free, but we're still not getting our travel. So this is idle position. This hooks to your gas pedal and you push it up and it's supposed to have more travel than that. But you can see this rod right here hooks onto this stick. That's your accelerator pedal. I'm sorry, your accelerator pump. And that is frozen. It's not giving us our travel. So it's stuck inside there. I tore the gasket. Great. It's actually pretty clean in there, other than some diesel fuel that I'm pretty sure was my doing. I 
been working pretty good. This is our accelerator pump. See? Now... Oh. Thought I heard it trying to come around. Just needed a little bit of convincing. Let's see if we can... Yeah. Yeah. There we go. That's what I'm talking about. She's coming back around. Yeah. Just need a little bit of convincing, a little bit of shimmying. So let's see, we got this carburetor all apart. Gonna start reassembling it. What you wanna do is when you're doing all this, you probably, some of you have done this before, some people might not have. All these orifices, they lead somewhere. See that, how it's coming out there coming out there coming out here and here so you just want to and this is your main fuel inlet you just want to blow it out you know make it's coming out here you can feel it coming out here coming out here and here coming out here see it I can feel it coming out there so all the orifices here are good to go there is a check ball here it's a new check ball that goes down in there make sure it's sort of centered this goes in here it's nice and free you don't want anything stuck or sticking this right here so feel it it's coming out the bottom so we're good there and this oh this goes in here goes like so tighten that goes directly in the center of this. It's like a metering rod. And then we got our old seat needle. Looks a little worn. We got our new seat gasket needle. Gasket goes on the seat. Put this in right here. Give it a good tighten. Needle drops down. Came with a new float, which we'll just go ahead and use. Our old rod. Set that. See this? Yeah, there's no else way for this to go. So this goes like that. There we go. Rod's coming out the other side. Let's give it a test. Alright. That's working. The top half, I think, is assembled. Now we get to our bottom half. And again, here's your uh, accelerator pump, the original one or whatever, an old one. It's pretty, pretty thrashed. So we're going to put our new one on. And then there is a check ball. So here's the new one right here. That drops down into the accelerator. Let me see. Yeah, that goes down into the accelerator bore. And let me remember how this goes. So there's a spring that goes down in there. 
accelerator pump. There it is. Nice, smooth, and new. And again, you want to check. Make sure everything is open. You can check it like this. See how there's stuff coming out the bottom? It's coming out. There's a hole in the, the Venturi here. So I already checked these. actually have to take this apart again and I, I did adjust the float levels with what the paper said so hopefully that's enough Let's see this goes like that correct And just so you guys can know, look at this, his little box says, thank you, Jesus. That's cool. I like that. And uh, pretty comprehensive kit. Everything worked perfectly. Well, we don't, it's not on yet, but everything fit right. Carb junkies, 770-457-8570. Uh, Good kit. I like it. I like it that it came with brass floats. It's cool. We have acceleration, choke, everything moves. Good deal. Did this come with a new gasket? I think it did. I just throw that on there. I think this is it. not the same uh, it doesn't look like I have the exact gasket for that so I'm just gonna put this one back on it Teflon tape, that should be a flared seal. Get the vacuum advance plugged into the back. And I'll tighten all this up and uh, I'll be back in a minute. Alright, carburetor's on. It's all bolted in and I'm just trying to go over in my head the last checks and balances, but I think we're getting there finally guys honestly uh, put these spark plugs in tighten them down put the wires back on them and then we will hook some fuel up you can see I got some line wrenches down there on the fuel pump crack that off and then I got a gas tank right here some fuel and my electric pump get that cranking
So 15, 36, 24. 1, 5, 30, 6, 20, 4. Okay. Firing order is correct. Wow. I'm gonna have to, uh... The line is twisting the uh, the fuel line, and if it doesn't break loose, then I'm gonna break the fuel line, which I do not want to do. Am I out of gas? Oh, you have, all right, all right. Just trying to heat something up. Yeah. Well, be careful, this pipe will superheat in a heartbeat. There we go. It was twisting the line. So I was trying to avoid. Cause so, I mean, heck, I got it. I want to reuse it. You know what you're doing. Well, sometimes I like to think I do. Ugh. There we go. Okay, I got this line. I never checked to see if this was plugged or not, so I just unhooked it. I got the fuel pump hooked up, my electric one hooked up to a, whatever, a tank, so I'm gonna just run it and see if it comes out. Full screen. Okay, okay. Yeah! Good deal, good deal. If you can ever get it to light and run, I think it'll... It'll go. I think it'll clear itself out. Yeah. You know, I'd like to get me a look at that tailpipe. It ain't even got any exhaust on it. Yeah, no, it does. Yeah. I'll be darned, it does. It's, it's got a down, a down pipe. Is it not rotted out or what? It's actually there? It don't look bad. Nice, good stuff. Dad wanted me to record the floor before and after we start it, if it will start. Because I don't have two cameras and a lot of people want to see what comes out. Okay, here we go. Right here. You're looking at it. You've seen it here live. We'll see what comes out. I'm going to hook up the... The curl? Yeah, well, it's sparking, so it's... Come on. Coil's hooked up. Uh, fuel... It ain't gear, is it? Well, clutch is in. You know, I'll be honest with you, it might be wise to just jack those two wheels up off the ground. Okay. Just in case you don't want this thing getting away from you. If you, if you could actually get it started, you could actually kind of mess with that shifter a little bit and make sure it's in. Okay. All right, you ready?
Bendix is done. Okay. Close. All right, so we took the starter off, we took it apart, lubricated the Bendix, tried to do what we could. The Bendix that Dad had that he was gonna let me use, this one right here, uh, it's too small. So we kinda have to make do with what we got. So we tried to lubricate it. It's not really a serviceable item, um, but we tried anyway. Put the starter back on already. It's kinda getting late, so I was just kinda trying to do this. And, uh, now that it's back on, we'll crank it and we'll we'll see if it works, you know, because if it's going to keep doing this, I'm going to get, I'll have to order a Bendix for it, but maybe it'll have enough life left in it to, you know, get it started at least. It is! She's trying everything she can. We're giving it any gas, we're going to flood it. Hold it to the floor. Come on, come on. <laughs> Dude, it was trying, man. It's, it's so low on compression that I'm, I'm having to feed it brake clean. Down. What? Hold the accelerator down. I, okay. Dude, it did it for a second. Yeah. You want to let it that starter cool off? Yeah. You're holding the starter down, aren't you? I was. All right. Is that a rod knocking? It sure sounds fun. But I don't know. Once it started, it, I didn't hear nothing knocking. It's kind of odd. You want it? <laughs> Bump it. Hold it down. Oof. Almost. Sounds like it. I think you need to put a can of rod bearing in it. <laughs> it ran. Hey, it ran. It did run. Yes. I'll give it that. And it didn't sound it didn't sound bad except for that noise. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't sound bad except for that rod knocking. That noise is elusive. Was there any oil getting to the top of this thing? Didn't see none. I didn't see a drop. Yeah, I think somebody ran her till the nod rocked. The noise is crummy. I need to run it a little. 
Well, yeah, it <laughs> ain't gonna hurt nothing now. Try it again. Maybe that noise will go away. <laughs> Maybe that noise will subside. <laughs> I don't know if that's a rod knocking or not. It runs like a dang sewing machine though. Wow, it sounds really good. There's no rod knocking. Valve platter. Heck yeah! I think it's valve platter. Sounds good. <laughs> yeah. I thought it sounded pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Something's a little off. That's just some valve clatter. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's some water in there. Something's turning into uh, steam. That is a big victory. This thing had no hope. This thing was on the verge. This thing was on the chopping block to be taken apart a couple of the times. I didn't think it was going to go. I was, uh, I was I was really worried about this one. You ain't out of the wood yet. All right, we're going to run it again. I want to see if it has any oil pressure. These things, they run low, low pressure. Um, the 235s ran higher pressure, but these are kind of old style. So, a little bit of gas. Clutches in. Yeah. Look at that. Started right up. That gauge could be stuck. I don't know. to see some uh, oil come up here. This is where it feeds in and then it drains. So it should be, see all these holes? Yeah, I don't see I don't see any oil coming up here yet. It should be faster than that. I mean you gotta a lot for some time, but dang, you know, it really it needs to catch up. I'm gonna burn it up. Oh my gosh. That is a lot of oil. Yeah. 
I mean, a lot of that smoking probably is the... Everything or, I've dumped in it? Yeah, everything that's been dumped in it until it gets burnt out of it. So last night was a pretty big victory getting this thing to run. This thing has not given me a single solitary inch since the moment I took it home. And there's a few things I want to do today with it. I have some radiator hoses that I'd ordered, so I think I want to put the radiator hoses on it, maybe take the thermostat out of it if it does have one, fill it with water, and run it again. There's, there's still a lot of oil in it. I want to run it again with water in it so we can run it a little longer. I want to see where it's leaking from, how bad it's leaking, dust. Probably a good thing we're doing this. See what's in that thermostat housing, honestly. Barely. Yeah, it's literally just full of dirt. What is this? What in the heck am I looking at? It just keeps coming. Look at that. I mean, is that the thermostat? Look at it. That's a wild. I mean, that's like the wildest thing I've ever seen. I mean, the only thing I can see is here it says uh, HRD7-50. A fascinating looking little piece of history. I mean, you're looking at a piece of history. I mean, this is what I'm pulling out of it, so. Pretty mucky. Oops. Uh, oh well. Something plugged up. No, I'm just trying to flush it out. I don't know, you know, what I'm doing. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I'm just... Never, never admit anything. That no, water looks pretty clean, but... It started sounding a little better the longer it ran, but it's funny, I never, I never seen no oil, you know? It's just a little valve clatter. <laughs> just a little valve clatter. <laughs> All right, pro tip, guys. It's a little trick uh, Dad taught me a long time ago. We always put anti-seize on our rad hoses because you know they go on real easy but they never come off easy and you don't want to yank and yank and yank. and you might need to pull it off again also but you don't want to yank on it so hard you break your radiator neck or something so I just dab some anti-seize on there and they'll go on and come off what pro tip pro tip you need to put a gallon on pro uh, just a little bit well a little dab will do you oh well Oh, you gonna leave the clamps pro off? tip, yeah, pro tip, put clamps on it when you do this. See, that's why you put anti-seize on it, because I had to just pull it back off. It would have never came back off. Crank it. Yeah. Look at that. She started right up, and it was a cold morning. There was actually frost on the ground here in Arizona, so that's a that's not bad. I got the upper one just pointed out. Well, you can see steam is already starting to come off, but uh, oh, there we go. I'm trying to flush this rat out, or the system anyway. See, it's 
Dirty? Yeah. Huh? It's like a little warm. See all that crap? It's just dirty. Look at that. There you go. Finished getting the hose on. It's running. Water in it. That water pump's trying to do something. It's not like a ton of flow, but I mean, it's moving around in there. See some crud. Rad's getting a little warm. I don't know, do you hear that knocking noise like you did? I mean, I don't know. So all things considered, I definitely think I hear a rod knocking when I put my hand on the oil pan or the block, I can hear a thump or I can feel a thump, thump, thump. You can hear it right now probably in the video. We're not getting oil up to the top end still and it's leaking out of every single hole. It's leaking somewhere in the front by the harmonic balancer. It's leaking out of the uh, lifter cover, the push rod cover on the side of the block. It's leaking somewhere in the back around the flywheel, maybe the oil pan, I don't know. And plus with that rod knock and no oil pressure, I don't know guys, I think that we're gonna have to call it quits on this engine, not the truck, this engine. We're not gonna be able to use this engine. And plus with it being the old style dipper, you know, motor, these never had high oil pressure in the first place. It's got Babbitt bearings, no inserts. I mean, that's why you see these motors for sale for a hundred bucks online. I think a 235 would go nicely in here. It's still sort of, it's still period correct, and it's it's just a massive upgrade from the 216s. Nothing left to do but see if it goes in gear. I guess. I mean, why not? Hail Mary! It motor's done anyway. We got a brick. Ha, ha, ha.